<coughs> Good evening, church family. It is great to be here this evening. So great to see everyone out. So thankful for the presence of all of those who were able to come out. I uh, uh, miss the inclement weather and uh, the sickness that is going on. We appreciate you. We appreciate those who are viewing for home. And I appreciate your support so very much. I want to continue to pray for all of those who are in need, in deep need of our prayers. And we want to uh, begin our Bible class tonight with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother Randall, if he would, to come and lead us in an opening prayer. And then once he leads that prayer, we will go ahead and get into our study of the book of Revelation. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful again for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity that we have this evening to come together to study from your word. We pray that as we study that we might all be made closer and wiser. We ask that you would bless those that are sick and not able to <clears throat> and not able to be with us and others that we may not know about we ask that your blessings would be with them and we thank you for those that have have been ill and not able to be about but that have been made better and we give you the, the praise and the glory we're thankful for our this nation that, that we live in. And we pray that you would bless us and help us to, as a nation, to turn to you. And we pray for the leaders of our nation that they might use wisdom as they lead. And we thank you for the church and for the privilege we have of being Christians, we pray that we may ever love one another as you tell us in, in your word that we're to do. We ask your blessings on the teachers tonight. Pray that they will have a, a good lesson. Pray for Brian as he brings the message tonight. We pray that you would go with us as we go through this service, that you would go with us through our future walks of life, that we might enjoy good health, and that we might use the good health you give us for your glory. We pray that you would go with us as we, as we go now, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate that prayer <clears throat> so very much. Open your Bibles, if you will, <clears throat> to the book of Revelation chapter 9. That's where we're going to pick up our study. And let me just remind you that if you if you have a question or, or a comment, though I'm up here and I'm not down there um, uh, before the, the, the congregation, I'm still before the congregation. And if you've got a question, don't, don't hesitate to ask or if there's a comment that you'd like to make. Um, I'll do my best to repeat it so the people at home can hear. And likewise, those at home, I, you can't verbally ask me a question out loud, but you can send a message. Uh, and, you know, if there's a question that you have about something that we something that we study, feel free to, to uh, you, you can send me a message uh, through my uh, telephone or through messenger on Facebook. Just let me know and I'll do my very best. If I can't answer it, um, I'll study and, and give you the best possible answer. That, that I can give. And of course, if you send out a question tonight, um, of course, I won't be able to address it until next week. But Lord willing, if I get those questions, I will, I will do my very best to address them. Revelation chapter 9, uh, in this chapter, what we saw as it opened up in verse 1, is you see the sounding of the fifth trumpet. We saw the first four trumpets sounded 
uh, sound out in chapter 8. And then as chapter 8 is closing, uh, what the writer does is he pronounces three woes. Woe, woe, woe. And those woes represent the remaining trumpets that are going to sound. And the very fifth trumpet is the first of those three woes that you read about in the latter part of chapter 8. And so in this woe or in this sounding of the trumpet, if you remember, the Bible says that there was a star that had fallen to heaven, uh, fallen from heaven to the earth. And we talked about the fact that we have to understand that's not referring to a literal star. I, mean, I compared a, the smallest star in the universe uh, to Saturn, which is which if it were to hit the earth, it would completely and utterly destroy it. And so we understand when we look at that that he has to be using figurative language. And the fallen star, my conclusion is that it is Satan. But regardless if that's your conclusion or not, I want us to try to focus in on the main points in this chapter, and we'll get to that here in just a moment. But I believe that it was Satan. In, in that passage, as you saw and I saw last week, he was given a key to the bottomless pit or the abyss. And we talked about that abyss. It, it appears from Scripture that this is referring to a holding place of those who are evil and wicked spirits. And then we talked about the fact that he released those individuals from that abyss. And, and we saw that smoke came up and it was like the smoke of a furnace. Now, keep in mind, we can go through and we can talk about, you know, what was the star and, and, and what was the smoke. And, and we're going to talk about locust here in a minute. When you get into chapter uh, when you get to verse 3, which is where we're going to pick up tonight, let's just read verse 3, and, and let's, let me make this point. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, you've got the star that has fallen, you've got smoke, you've got this abyss, you've got these locusts. Later on, they're going to be described as scorpions, and then beginning in verse 7 and going through verse 10, there is a sevenfold description of these locust, scorpion like creatures. And if we are not careful, what we will do is we will get caught up in trying to figure out what they are and what they represent. And I think the most important thing that we need to understand when we look at this chapter is number one, regardless of our conclusion, who was in control of this situation? God. Who's in control of our situation today? God, okay? And, and the way that we know that, when you see this star falling from heaven, the Bible says that a key was given to Him, right? We looked at verse 3 right there, and to those locusts, or those locust scorpion-like creatures, look at what it says, Power was given to them. My question is, who gave them that power? I would suggest and tell you the same being that gave Satan the power to tempt Job. When you read the book of Job, one of the things that you and I should quickly understand is that Satan could not do anything to, God, to, to, to Job that God didn't allow. Could he? When we read the book of Job, we need to quickly and, and, and in a, a very understanding way, come to the conclusion that Job is not guilty of sin. That's what his three friends thought. But Job is not guilty of sin. In fact, when you get to the end of that book, God reproves those three friends and said, you have not spoken what is right in the sight of God as my servant Job has. This was a battle between God and Satan. And likewise, when we look at this book of Revelation, it is a battle between God and Satan. Now, we already know who wins the battle, don't we? It's God. All right? And I have to keep that thought in my mind. It is God. When you think about people in our world today and, and, and how we can take that and apply it to us today, just as God was in control here, God is in control in our lives regardless if it's something physical that we are struggling with, if it's something spiritual we are struggling with, or even in our day and age, if it's something politically that we are struggling with. Who is always in charge? God is. I want you to look at Proverbs 21 and verse 1. Proverbs 21 
And I want you to note verse 1 with me there. In Proverbs 21 in verse 1, the Bible says, The king's heart is in the hand of who? It's in the hand of the Lord, isn't it? Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. What does that verse mean to you? You think the things that happen on, happen in our country today are, are because of those who are in power? Come on, brothers and sisters, we know better than that. Nothing has ever happened that God has not allowed. And you continue on. Go back to chapter 19, the book of Proverbs, verse 21. Go to Proverbs 19, 21. Look at what the Bible says there. There are many plans in a man's heart. We make plans every day, don't we? Did you make plans today? Yes, you did. I made plans today. When I got up this morning, I had a list of things that I wanted to accomplish in this day. But look at the rest of it. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel was stand. At the end of the day, what's going to happen? Whatever the Lord wants to happen. Why is that? Because the very clear fact that He is reigning. Go to Psalm chapter 97 with me. Go to Psalm chapter 97, and I want you to look at verse 1. Psalm 97 in verse 1. The Bible says, the Lord reigns. <laughs> and then naturally, let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of the isles be glad. The Lord is reigning. And you know what we ought to do? We ought to rejoice. In fact, drop down to verse 9. For you, Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The reason that God reigns is because He's the greatest being who has ever existed or will ever exist. And how long is He going to reign? Go to Psalm 146. Go to the book of Psalm chapter 146 and look at verse 10. The Lord shall reign. What's the word? Forever. Will there ever come a time when God will stop reigning? No, brothers and sisters. No. And so regardless of our conclusions when we look at the book of Revelation or, or, or whatever book that we look at, I need to understand that, that God is in control and that He reigns. And so that brings us to this point. Let's talk about the locust. What, what did these locusts here in the context of this Scripture represent? Because the Bible says, Then the smoke of the locust came out of the earth, and then if you'll note there, to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. I believe that you should uh, have all of the different views concerning what someone might say about a biblical text. And so I'm not going to be biased and get up here and tell you, okay, this is what it is. I'm going to present the two main arguments as to what these locusts represent. And then you can pick, and then we will try to find a common ground to where we can land together. When you think about these the locusts here in this passage of Scripture, of course, um, the, the locusts were released from the pit in verses 2 through 3. A lot of people believe that these were literal locusts that came in and afflicted the people on the land. Uh, and, and the reason that they do that is because of the fact that this, this setting right here seems to be very fitting to the plague of locusts in the book of Exodus. Do you remember that? Let's go there for just a moment in the book of Exodus chapter 10. Let's go to Exodus chapter 10. Um, very familiar story probably to all of us. I can remember growing up reading about the, the 10 different plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians because of their wickedness toward God's people. Now keep in mind, all of these plagues were brought against these people these enemies of God because they had mistreated God's people. And the people began to cry out and God came to the point where he said, I've had enough and I'm going to rescue my people. And I think when you look at the book of Revelation, you can apply that same teaching. God has seen these Romans, uh, the Roman Empire persecute his people and God has reached a point where he said, I have had enough. And chapters 9 and throughout the rest of the book is all about God bringing punishment upon what I believe to be the Roman Empire. But in Exodus chapter 12, let me get back. 
us away from that thought. I want you to begin reading in verse uh, uh, Exodus. I'm in chapter 12, getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Uh, chapter 10 and verse 12. <clears throat> Sometime tonight, Lord willing, we're going to go to chapter 12. That's why I was already there. And so let me back up, put it in reverse. But in, in Exodus chapter 10, beginning in verse 12, look at what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locust, there's our word, locust, for the locust that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out the rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all the day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. And the locust went over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Look at the severity of these locusts. Previously, there had not been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. So what do we know about these locusts that invaded the land? There had never been a swarm of locusts like this, and never would there ever be one. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees, which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. And so when I look at this, I understand that these were literal locusts, just like the hail that came. The hail fell from the sky, destroyed the trees. It was literal hail falling from the skies. And likewise, this swarm of locusts, this was a literal swarm of lo locusts that God brought upon the land of the Egyptians. And a lot of people believe that these were literal uh, literal um, locusts, but to a greater degree. They're kind of dressed up. In fact, they're, they're given the name to be like scorpions. And so they're, they're locusts, but as we see the description, you're going to see that they've got a tail like a, a locust. Now, when you think of a locust, a lo uh, I mean a, a scorpion, a scorpion was uh, an insect that was very prevalent in that particular era of time or in that particular region, right? And they have a very, very nasty sting. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But with the idea of a scorpion, I want you to look at Luke chapter 10 with me. Luke chapter 10, all right? Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 10, and I want you to look at verses 17 through 20 with me there. Luke 10, beginning in verse 17. Look at what the scripture says. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, the first thing I want you to look at or, or to notice when you see this passage of Scripture is right in verse 19, you have mentioned Serpents and what? Scorpions, okay? What we want to do is we want to see how the word scorpion is used here in the context of the Scripture. Jesus begins, or verse 17 begins, with the 70 returning from the limited commission, and they are just overfilled with joy. And they said, the demons are subject to us, all right? to your name. I need to understand, number one, that that word demon there is not the word devil. I know there are some translations that may have the word devil there, and that's not the word. This particular word comes from the Greek word daimonion, which literally means an evil spirit. The word diabolos is the word devil, and that's the word that you will see that is applied to Satan himself. But this is not the word devil. This has reference to to evil spirits. So the disciples come back and they say, Lord, even the demons or even the evil spirits, they are subject to your name. In other words, we had authority over them. Okay? 
Now, drop down to verse 20. And he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject unto you. Now look at what Jesus does in this passage. He equates the word spirits, the individuals who were in authority to them, to the demons. And so when you put these two terms together, this is talking about evil spirits. All right? Now, right in the middle, you've got scorpions. Were these literal scorpions? No. But because of the fact of the way that uh, maybe they were vicious toward the individual, then they are described as scorpions. Now, I'm bringing that point to you to, to point out this. A lot of people believe that the locusts were literal locusts in uh, that they were literally, uh, let me back up, they, they believe that they were literally demons, evil spirits in the disguise of locusts and scorpions. All right? Now that's one belief. Now there is another belief that these were not literal locusts, that these were not demons in a locust body or in a scorpion body but rather they were men. And there are several reasons why this conclusion is drawn. First of all, you have to understand that there's a lot of symbolic language going on here in this passage of Scripture. To begin with, when you think about Satan, and he's referred to as a fallen star, I understand that that is not literal. This is not a literal star. Likewise, when you see the word smoke, I, I have to understand that this is not necessarily literal smoke. And the reason that, that I would suggest that, I want you to begin looking at verse 1, and I want you to do this on your own. I want you to go through and circle every time you see the word like appear. All right? In verse 2 it says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace. Note, it, it was like smoke of a great furnace. What's being emphasized in this passage of Scripture? Some might say, well, it's the smoke. I'm going to suggest unto you, it's the greatness of what's about to happen because it's described as the smoke as a great furnace. Just imagine for a moment this huge furnace and it is literally belching out smoke that could be seen for miles and miles and miles away. And the idea in the context of the Scriptures, what is about to happen is going to be known across the world. It is going to be great. Why? Because the one who is behind it is God. He's the one who is allowing this. Again, when you continue throughout this passage, you drop down to verse 7. In the description of these locusts, there's a sevenfold description. All right, Beginning in verse 7, it says the shape of the locust was... Not horses, but look at the word right in front of it. Do you see it? It's like horses. And, and then again, they had crowns like gold, and their faces were like uh, of the faces of men. In verse 8, again, they had hair like women's hair. That word like there literally means to resemble or to be in comparison to. And so when you look at the very fact that there's a lot of symbolic language here, I realize that the star is not literal. It's not talking about a literal star. And then I'm going to ask myself the question, are these locusts literal locusts? I have difficulty believing that they are. Because look at this one also. In verse 4, I want you to look at who they are commanded to harm. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth. Or any green thing or any tree. Wait a minute. What is it that locusts eat? Grass and uh, trees and, and, and leaves and stuff. They'll go in and they'll literally eat the bark off of a tree. And so they destroy everything that the Bible says that they were not to destroy. Well, who is it they're going to hurt? But only those what? Men. And so they are literally going to be attacking men. Later on, you're going to see that they're going to be many men. And again, when you drop down into verse 6, in those days men will seek death. Right? And so because of that language, I, I have a difficulty believing that these are literal locusts. Right? What then are they? There is the suggestion that, as we made mention, that it is an army of men. 
Go with me, if you will, to the book of Joel, chapter 1. And, and I want you to see if you can see some similar language here in this passage. Joel, chapter 1. And in Joel, chapter 1, I want you to begin reading with me in verse 4. And I'm going to give you a second to get to the book of Joel. The only reason I got there fast is because I was flipping there uh, all day going back and forth to make sure I could get there. So, <laughs> All right. In Joel chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, look at what the Bible says. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So there you've got the word locust, right? So what's in our mind right now? Probably a literal locust. Wouldn't you be thinking that? Is your, if you're just uh, casually reading this passage, you're going to be thinking, well, he's talking about literal locusts. Let's, let's not stop there. Verse 5, Awake you drunkards and weep and wail all you drinkers of wine because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong, without number. You know, it appears that what Joel does is he talks about locusts, getting them to think of a very destructive force. Because in Old Testament times, when an individual heard the word locusts, it brought terror to people because they understood that locusts were very destructive insects. And it seems as if what Joel is doing here in this passage is he is saying that the locusts represented a nation. And this, if this is talking about God's people being carried away into uh, captivity, then that would have been the, the Babylonians and the Persians who carried God's people away, a great nation that came up against them. Look at his further description of them in verse 6. After he says strong without number, his teeth are like the teeth of a what? Do you see it? A lion. Now, what we're going to see when we look at the description of the locusts, they are going to be described as having teeth like a lion. And so you've got a similarity there. And then drop down to chapter 2. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, blow the trumpet in Zion. Oh, isn't that ironic? We're talking about a trumpet being blown, right? Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble because the day of the Lord is coming for it is as, as hand. This is not the second coming of Christ. Remember, the, the day of the Lord can refer to a judgment that God is bringing upon a nation or it can refer to the second coming of Christ. The context determines. And since this world is still here and Jesus has not returned, then this has to deal with a judgment that God is bringing upon His people. Now, with that thought in mind, drop down to verse 4. The Bible says their appearance, this nation that is coming against my people, their appearance is like the appearance of what? Horses. Now, one of the things that you're going to see about the locusts is they are described as horses. And so because of this particular passage, it, it seems as if maybe that, that uh, John has in mind a nation of people that were going to come in and they were going to be like these grasshoppers. They were going to destroy a lot of things in the land. That They were going to inflict a lot of pain upon those of the Roman Empire, so much so that they would wish for death. And Some have suggested, well, you know, who could that be? And, and there's at least one suggestion. When you look at the pink outline on this map, that was the Roman Empire. That was all of the territory that they were able to control. However, if you take the time to look over here, you'll see the Perinthian Empire. Of all the people that Rome tried to conquer, this was a group of people that they could not conquer. Uh, they never could win a battle against these individuals. And the Roman Empire was uh, literally afraid of these individuals. And, and so some have suggested that maybe it was the Perinthians who came in and did this. I, I don't know, brethren, I don't. Was it literal locusts that came in? I don't know. Was this an army of men that came in? I'm going to be honest with you. I, I really don't know. And, and to tell you the truth, that I don't think that is the point of the passage. 
The point of the passage, I think, is found in verse 4. Look at what it says. They, and that's talking about the locusts, look at verse 4, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men, only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The only individuals who were going to be afflicted by this devastation and this destruction were those who did not have the seal of God. So what is John trying to get these people to see? Likewise, us today. Those who are sealed by God, God's going to take care of them. Right or wrong? Has God not always taken care of His people? Whether it be famine, whether it be persecution, whether it be death, has God not always taken care of His people? Why? Because they are sealed. You remember we talked about chapter 7. Chapter 7 was all about those who were sealed. And, and what John wanted them to know is, yes, bad things are happening, but you have been sealed and someday you're going to be in heaven with God. Because the word sealed not only means to identify with a mark, but it means to recognize as a possession. John wanted these people to know that they belong to God. Who do you and I belong to today? We belong to God. Move your lips like you mean it. Do we belong to God or not? We do, brothers and sisters. And we need to never forget that. These people needed to know that. And that's a message that you and I need to know. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. I mean Ephesians chapter 1, I'm sorry. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to look at verses 14 and 15 and look at what the Bible says. In Ephesians 1 and verse 13, the Bible says, In Him, that's talking about Jesus, in Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, talking about Jesus also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now Paul is talking about these people who were in Christ Jesus. And those who are in Christ Jesus have been sealed. And he goes on to say in verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to praise of to the praise of His glory. In other words, nothing is going to change if you and I stay in Christ Jesus. We're always going to live in a sealed condition. What is it that seals us? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't it? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what seals us. That's what protects us. And, and, and good people, when you think about the very fact that we, we are God's people and we have been sealed by God, do we believe that He has the ability to take care of us? We ought to. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 2. And someone read verse 9. Huh, I, I'm sorry. That's old habit. People at home won't hear you read verse 9. I'm sorry. Uh, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust punishment for the day of judgment. Now, either we believe that or we don't. Does God know what He's doing? Yes. And I trust Him. One more. Go to the book of Jude. There's only one chapter. <laughs> Verse 24. Go to the book of Jude. Verse 24. And look at what the Bible says. Now to him who is able, I love that word able, and I'm going to stop and count there for a minute because it comes from the Greek word dunamite, from which you and I get the word dynamite. When we think of dynamite, what comes to our mind? Explosive and powerful. Jude begins by saying to him who is able. And, and the very fact that this is a perfect tense verb literally means that he has been able in the past. He's able right now. There will never come a time when God will stop being able. The good people, that's the God we serve. He is an all-powerful God. You and I run out of energy every day, right? I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to put my shorts on and I'm going to kick back because I'm going to be tired. You're going to do the same thing. But God don't get tired. 
God doesn't run out of power, does He? And the Bible says that He is able to do what? To keep, to guard, to protect you from stumbling, from falling, and to present you faultless or blameless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who is alone, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now forever. Amen. Folks, I may not understand every book, every chapter, every verse, every word, but I think we can all camp on what we just read, don't you? That God is going to take care of us. He's always taking care of us and, and nothing is going to change that. So, regardless of what you believe, whether it be literal locusts or whether you believe that this was an army of men, Understand the greatness of it, like that great furnace. This was something that every individual in that Roman Empire was going to be touched by, except the people of God. I want you to note that. In verses 4 through 6, you've got the mission of the locust. And if there was one word that I think we could pick from this section of Scripture that would describe the mission of the locust, I think it's found in verse 5. Look at verse 5 and see if you can figure out what word I'm going to think about. How can we describe the mission of the locust? You see the word torment? It's there three times, isn't it? Torment, torment, and then tormenting. Right? And, and that was the mission of the locust. They were literally going to torment. And the word torment means literally means to be in, in severe pain. Not just pain. I'm, I'm talking about severe pain to where an individual would literally scream out. You ever been around someone like that before? Maybe they're, they're sick or they're hurt terribly bad or sadly maybe even they're dying. And you literally hear them scream out in pain. That, that's the torment that you've got going on right here. And, and, and when you look at this passage, it, it, this torment, remember back in verse 4, who is it going to be administered to? Only those men who don't have the seal. Do you see that? And that's talking about non-Christians. So what is the text suggesting here? Excuse me. That God's people were going to be protected. Literally? I tend to believe so. Let me give you an illustration, and, and, and you're going to see this. Go to Exodus chapter 8 and verse 22. Go to Exodus chapter 8 and uh, in verse, 20, verse 22. Now, when you look at the, the ten plagues that were brought upon Egypt, the first three... Uh, appeared to affect the uh, children of Israel also. But the fourth one, which was the flies, I want you to look at what's, what it says in verse 22 of Exodus 8. And in that day I set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people Tomorrow this sign shall be. And then drop down in chapter 9 and verse 4. And it says, And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Huh. So the children of Israel were not affected by the flies. Here God's making the promise. You're not going to be affected by the, uh, the uh, livestock being diseased. Go to verse uh, 6 and see if that's what happened. So the Lord did this thing on the next day and all the livestock of Egypt died. Watch it. But the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Drop down to verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were was there no hail. When God brought the plague of the hail. Can you imagine that? God literally protected that particular region. Hmm. Go to chapter 10 and verse 23. 10, 23. 
They did not see one another, nor did any rise from this place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That was the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. And what does it say about God's people? They were not affected by it. Now, there, there's one other that I want you to consider. All right? Chapter 12, verse 13. Chapter 12, 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Right? Now, the greatest plague that God brought upon the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn. But what did God promise the Israelites, his children? If you'll take blood and put it over the doorpost and you stay in that house, then that plague won't affect you. And everyone who did that, when he saw the blood, okay, now, what is it about those who are sealed that makes us, that made these people so special? What does God see? He sees the blood. Go to chapter 12 of the book of Revelation. Go to chapter 12 in the book of Revelation. Now in chapter 12, you've got the battle uh, beginning in verse 7 between the dragon and his angels and they fought. And I love verse 8. They lost. That's the way I'm going to put it. They were losers. They did not prevail. Don't you, don't you like to be able to call the devil a loser? Because that's exactly what he is. He's just a big old loser. He's lost the battle. I'm going to win because God won. Right? You're going to win. The devil is a loser. And it, it described as the great dragon, the devil, and Satan. Now, in verse 10, the Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God. That's the church, folks. That's you and me. And the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. All oh, Satan is accusing us right and left because he wants us to fail. But who has fallen? He has. And verse 11, read it. Soak it in like a sponge. And they, the kingdom of God, the church, you and I, and they did what? Look at the word. Brand it on your mind. They overcame. How did they do it? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. They were able to overcome because of the blood of the Lamb and because of what the book says. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I am not going to stand here and tell you what God can and cannot do. But we saw clearly in the book of Exodus that God protected His people. We see that God promises to protect His people here. Why is it that this day and age that we come to the conclusion that He can no longer protect us? Has He lost His power? I don't believe He has. And I believe God has the power to protect us. Why? Because we are covered by the blood. That's what the Scripture says. These people, if you'll note, it didn't stop the persecution, but these individuals were protected uh, from this onslaught of wickedness that was about to be delivered. In verse 5, if you'll look at what it said, it said, And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Now, note if you will that they were tormented and they were tormented for, the, for a period of five months. Now, what does that have reference to? Is it referring to five literal months? I, I don't know. I think it's very ironic that the uh, locusts usually come somewhere between May and September. Now, if you count up the months, that's five months, right? May, June, July, August, September. And so it is a possibility that this lasted for five months. But then again, some are going to argue that locusts do not stay for a period of, of five months. Well, you're going to have to get back to the point of these literal locusts. I think a better explanation would be it's just a, a definite measure of time. Uh, in, in other words, these people were going to be tormented until God said enough. Because remember who's in control. We've already seen that. 
who is given the key and who is given the power? God. And so when God says that's enough, then that's exactly what's going to happen. But they were going to be tormented like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Now, I have never been stung by a scorpion before, but I have read and I have heard where people tell that it is extremely painful. It's, it's not normally lethal unless maybe it's a, a, an infant or maybe someone who is elderly or, or maybe someone who has a lot of health problems. Most of the time it's just extremely painful from, painful from what I've read and it makes you feel as if you, you wish you were dead. Right? Well, could it be that's why you've got the very next verse, verse 6, in those days, right? the days when they're being tormented, in those days men will seek death but look at what it says. They will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. You remember in chapter 6 where the martyr said, How long, O oh God? How long before you avenge us? What's God saying? Here I go. I'm loading up and I'm getting ready and, and I'm about to avenge you. There may be times in our lives when we look at this old world and, and we are trying to walk in the light as His in the light. We are striving to live righteous lives. And, and we may come to the conclusion, how long, Lord? How, how long are you going to wait? When are you going to come back and get us and take us home with you? And there's going to come a day when God's going to answer that call. Just like He answered it here in the book of Revelation. He's going to answer that call to you and me. We've just got to be those people. We keep pressing forward. We are sealed. right? We keep living our lives for the Lord, in the Lord, covered by the blood, walking in the light as He is in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. When we commit a sin, we confess our sin. And we know that He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And we just keep on walking regardless of the circumstances. And when we do that, and good people, we can have the hope of a home in heaven someday. Now, beginning in verse 7 and going through verse 10, you have what I would refer to as a description of these locusts. Now, I think it's interesting if you go through, there's a sevenfold description. Look at it with me. In verse 7, it says, The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. There's the first description. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, number two. And their faces were like the face of men, number three. And they had hair like women's hair, number four. And their teeth were like lion's teeth, number five. And they had a breastplate, they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, number six. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. And then verse 10. And they had tails like scorpions, number seven. Now, here's what we can do. We can go through this list and we can talk about what each one represents. Right? And to tell you the truth, most of the people that I tried to look up and read, they didn't know. They, they just made assumptions. And I'm going to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, I don't know what all of this represents. I don't. There are a few terms that just kind of jump out. And you think about horses prepared for battle. In other words, this, this torment that they were going to bring upon the Roman Empire, it was prepared. It was planned out. And the reason it was prepared and planned out is because you're going to see in verse 11, they had a king. They had a leader. What's so interesting about that, which is another thing that causes me to believe that these are not literal locusts, is because according to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, uh, locusts don't have a leader. They don't. They just fly in a swarm. But these locusts represented in this passage, they have a leader. And he is identified in verse 11 as Abaddon and Apollon. And we're going to talk about that. We're not going to get to it tonight. But I think the greatest thing that we need to understand um, about this passage of Scripture is this torment that God was going to allow to be inflicted upon these people. The number seven description, I think it was a perfect torment. Something that 
you could not in your wildest imagination dreamed up to be more severe. When I think about that, it reminds me of the torment, the wrath that God has in store for those who leave this world disobedient. I have seen people and heard people make the statement, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I know I'm going to hell. And I'm just like, man, you just we, we just don't know what we're saying when we make statements like that. An almighty God who has the power to save us Likewise has the power to destroy us. To cast us into a lake that burns forever and ever and ever. And I don't want to ever be a part of that place. You've been a great class as you always are. Uh, we're going to stop in verse 10. Lord willing, we will pick up in verse 11 next week. And we will conclude this section. We'll talk about the, uh, the leader of the bottomless pit or the abyss. Um, that, that is identified here and then we'll talk about verse 12 and then we'll get into the last section of this uh, passage beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 21 you you have been a great class and as always i enjoy teaching it Good evening, everyone. Isn't it great to be out tonight? Did it feel like fall out there to y'all today? I was driving home from work and it was about 70 degrees. I couldn't believe it. It was very, very nice. Don't we have a great God that can uh, stir up hurricanes in the ocean and bring cool weather in the middle of September? It's really great. We've got a lot to be thankful for. Make sure that you thank God for all, all things when you, when you pray tonight. Uh, be sure to pray for our nation. For our leaders, there's a lot going on. We've got elections going on. We need to pray about that, that people will be elected that will lead our country in a righteous way because we know that righteousness exalts a, a nation, and that's what we want. Uh, be sure and look at the bulletin. Review that. There's a full list of all the sick in there. We want you to be sure and keep everyone in your prayers as well. Um, don't forget our gospel meeting coming up. Larry Acuff is going to be speaking with us. That'll be the week of October 11th, uh, 7 p.m. each night. Make sure you're here for that. Uh, a little bit sooner than that, September 26th, we're going to have a youth event at uh, mine and Karen and Chloe's home. So make sure that you make plans to have that on your calendar and join us as well. It is great to have 
Brian Pettyjohn leading our lesson tonight. We're thankful for him and his dedication. And uh, we are going to have a closing prayer by Randy Overby. And as we go into our lesson, we'll, uh, we'll begin our, our worship with song. We'll be singing more about Jesus. More about Jesus. Together, let us sing. More about Jesus. The song will be 590. I'd like to say good evening to everyone. I'll read a verse here to you that'll let you think about something. The book is Matthew, the chapter is 6. And the verse is 33. The book Matthew, the chapter 6, and the verse is 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, if you seek in God first, you're going to be here Sunday morning. If you seek in God first, You'll be here for Sunday morning worship. If you're seeking God first, you'll be here for Sunday night worship. And if you're seeking God first, you'll be here Wednesday night as well to hear these fine lessons. And we even got a bonus, and I'm glad the elders were doing this and going ahead and running our gospel meeting. That's another opportunity. If you seek God first, everything else in life will fall into place. I've noticed over the past few years of my life, if I put God first, everything flows smoothly most of the time. But if I put myself first or anything else first, life is haywire in my life. And nothing goes right. But that's some thoughts I have concerning this. If you put God first in everything you do, everything else will fall into place. And one thing you can do if you're not one of his children is become one tonight. You got to hear the word, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And after that, you have left faithful unto death. And if you've done that and strayed away, come up for it as it's everlastingly too late as we stand and sing. Just as
here and answer us and I know that we have neighbors out there who struggle with difficulties in their lives and we pray for this man Edgar tonight as he has difficulties in his life and we know that you know the needs of every one of us on the face of this earth we pray that you will help us to be able to help him in some way spiritually that he will have his life touched by thy word and that he will be obedient to thy word before it is eternally too late. And we're so thankful for the power of thy gospel's message, for the word that we can hold in our hands and read and to understand. We pray that you will help us to be susceptible to it every day that we live. Help us to always seek that kingdom first in our lives, in thy righteousness, and be found faithful to thee. Pray that when you're done with us, you will, that we will have an eternity with thee in heaven. So it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, my Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity that you have given us to be here through this midweek. And my Father, we're just so thankful for all the many blessings of life that we have. We're thankful for the country that we live in, for the, the freedom and the, the blessings that we have. We know, Heavenly Father, that all this comes from thee. And Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the church here and the faith, for what it means to this community. We're thankful for all our many members that we have. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to bless them. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Brother David and his ability to pe preach and teach the gospel. We're just thankful for the lesson that he's brought to us tonight. That Heavenly Father, will apply it to our lives and uh, be better Christians and, and help bring more souls to thee. And we just ask Heavenly Father, you bless him and his family. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our elders here that lead us and guide us. We just ask that you give them blessings and give them the wisdom and the strength to keep on having the truth being taught here. And Heavenly Father, we are... Uh, Mind for this country at this time, at the things that are going on. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that the country would look to thee and know that you are the answer to all the problems, Heavenly Father. And we also pray for the, the election coming up, Heavenly Father, that the right one will be uh, elected, that it will hopefully uh, look to thee for the guidance to, to run the country, Heavenly Father. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with us. Uh, our sick that been mentioned tonight, that be thy will, give them the health back, may they be out with us once again, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with those that lost loved ones, help them and comfort them as only as you can. And now, Heavenly Father, we're going through this week. Be with us and guide us and bring us back to the next point in time and keep us safe. This in Christ's name I pray. Amen. <laughs>